Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Grand Rounds. My name is Adita Lati. I am one of the uh, Grand Rounds directors, along with Drs. Rebecca Mueller and Alex Harris. Uh, next week's Grand Round will be presented by Dr. John Cryan from the University of Cork at Ireland. The title of his talk is Gut Feelings, the Microbiome is a Key Regulator of Brain and Behavior Across the Lifespan. This Grand Rounds will also be remote, so there'll be a, a Zoom link provided. Before we introduce today's speaker, I wanted to give you a few quick housekeeping notes. We encourage everyone to ask questions during the Grand Rounds itself. Please use the Q&A feature, not the chat feature, as it'll help us curate questions. Also, if you're a trainee, please write the word trainee, as we'd like to prioritize trainee questions. Finally, please indicate whether you'd like to ask the question yourself, or if you'd prefer that we read it for you. If you'd like to read it yourself, we'll promote you temporarily to panelist. So again, please use the Q&A feature, indicate if you're a trainee, and indicate if you'd like to ask the question yourself. Now, today we have a very special Grand Rounds hosted by the Office of Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion in honor of Black History Month. And we have a double uh, special because not only do we have a great speaker, but we have the great privilege of us or to have as our moderator, Dr. Patrice Harris. Dr. Harris is a board certified psychiatrist, public health director, and patient advocate, and she's currently also a visiting professor here at Columbia. She grew up in Bluefield, West Virginia, and dreamt of entering medicine at a time when few women of color were encouraged to become physicians. She obtained her medical degree from West Virginia University and completed her psychiatry residency and fellowships at Emory School of Medicine. She was the 175th president of the American Medical Association and the first African-American woman elected to that position. She has also served on the AMA Board of Trustees and chaired the AMA Council on Legislation. She has led the AMA's efforts to end the opioid epidemic and been part of the task force since its very inception. Most importantly, perhaps she has been a role model and mentor to so, so many people. I could go on forever, but I'll end with something that someone just said to me yesterday. When Patrice Harris enters a room, the room brightens up. So let's brighten up this Zoom room and introduce very warmly Dr. Harris. Well, thank you so much for that very kind uh, introduction. It is my honor to be able to introduce the person who will be introducing our uh, wonderful uh, speaker today. But uh, junior faculty member that I have the honor of um, introducing certainly is a star in her own right. And so you may know this, but in an effort to highlight and support junior faculty, it is the practice of the Office of Equity, Diver uh, Diversity and Inclusion uh, to invite one member of the junior faculty to introduce the Grand Round speaker. And so today I will introduce you to Dr. Bernadine Waller. Uh, the principal investigator of the DIVA Lab. I, I, I love that acronym and love that uh, description. Uh, Dr. Waller is an award-winning National Institute of Mental Health T32 postdoc research fellow in the department. Uh, she is an implementation a scientist who partners with community and faith-based faith organizations to tailor and implement evidence-based mental health interventions for underserved survivors of intimate partner violence. Her groundbreaking research is transforming the domestic violence service provision system. Her NIMH funded dissertation research has been used in the UK. It helped reshape the reauthorization of the Violence Against Women Act and redesign the domestic violence service provision system in New York City. She's a principal investigator of the DIVA Lab. The lab partners with faith and community-based organizations to deliver culturally responsive mental health care to underserved intimate partner violence survivors. Her scholarship can be found in high impact journals, including the Lancet, the Lancet Psychiatry, the American Journal of Psychiatry and Trauma, Violence and Abuse. She is the member of, she is a member of the Women's Council, a subcommittee of the Council on Social Work Education, the Research Capacity and Development Committee for the Society for Social Work and Research, and as a doctoral student was inducted into the New York Academy of Medicine. Dr. Waller. 
Thank you so very much. And it is my great pleasure to introduce this morning's Grand Rounds speaker, Grand Round speaker, Dr. Deidre M. Anglin is Associate Professor of Psychology in the Clinical Psychology PhD program at the City College of the City University of New York, also known as CCNY. Dr. Anglin has specialized research training in psychiatric epidemiology from Columbia University's Mailman School of Public Health and co-leads the Ethno-Racial Inequities and Social Determinants Unit of the Opal Schizophrenia Methods Core. Dr. Anglin directs the Clinical and Social Epidemiology Lab at CCNY, leading projects focused on identifying social determinants of psychosis risk in racial and ethnic minoritized populations. She is internationally recognized for her work and expertise in this area with over 70 peer-reviewed publications, several grants, and was given the inaugural award for her sustained contributions to social justice by the Society of Research in Psychopathology. Without further ado, I introduce to some and present to others, Dr. Deidre M. Anglin, Dr. Anglin. Thank you so much, Dr. Waller. This is, I think, the most organized Grand Rounds I've ever presented. <laughs> and, and so I'm really excited to be here. Um, I'm going to just get started. And um, so today I'm going to, and I'm assuming everyone can see my screen. I'm going to talk about structural racism and social determinants of psychosis, which is something that I've been interested in and studied for uh, a very long time. And I'm really excited to see uh, younger folks, postdocs approaching me because they're interested in this work now, because there was definitely a time where no one really <laughs> was sort of looking at this um, and to this level. Um, and so as I get started, I don't have any uh, financial relationships with commercial interests or conflicts of interest to report. So for today, hoping to tackle three learning objectives effectively. First, really explain how structural racism contributes to both the overdiagnosis of schizophrenia in Black people and higher prevalence of psychotic experiences. Describe how social factors connected to racial discrimination contribute to vulnerability for psychotic experiences in Black and Latinx folks. And identify factors that could improve clinical assessment of psychosis in racially minoritized groups. So going to the first objective. So first, you know, when I say race, racism, I'm really not talking about like sort of one mean person. I'm talking about this socially constructed stratification of power based on proximity to whiteness, which is also a social construct typically with individuals of African descent being the most distal category in this perception. And the purpose really is to maintain this um, sort of sense of white supremacy, which is that things connected to whiteness are good or you know, sort of all, all, um, all supreme. And I think I like to, uh, you know, Ta-Nehisi Coates when he said, race is the child of racism, not the father. And so part of what makes race salient is racism, right? And so I'm just read this, you know, the new people were someone else before they were white. The elevation in the belief of being white was not achieved through wine tasting, but rather through pillaging of life, liberty, labor, and land. The strangling of dissidents, the rape of mothers, the sale of children, denial of the right to secure and govern our own bodies. And I find this to be so powerful because it speaks to just how intergenerational this is, how violent it is, um, and sort of, um, you know, the idea that it's evolving, the, the understanding of race, racism. Um, and, and so this is something to keep in mind as we go through the lecture. And so one finding that has been something I've grappled with for decades. Differences in the prevalence of psychosis, right? Racial differences in the prevalence of psychosis maps closely to this socially constructed hierarchy that I'm talking about. 
in many high income countries, including the United States, with those of African descent, Black folks, with the highest prevalence of diagnoses, right? And so, what does this then mean? Sort of overdiagnosis. And this has been found, you know, for, for, for decades, where even a meta analysis done by Olberg and colleagues found Black individuals were 2.4 times more likely to receive a diagnosis of schizophrenia than white individuals. And this meta analysis included not just the United States, but also Northern European countries, but it included, you know, outpatient health centers, inpatient state hospitals even um, the Kaiser Permanente birth cohort study that um, Mickey Bresnahan looked at this and found a two to three fold increase among African-Americans compared to white um, Americans. And so there's a way in which this has been seen as uh, a chronic sort of find, you know, finding that has been found repeatedly and in terms of internationally has been found even more um, sub substantially in terms of the odds ratios for Black uh, immigrants um, of Caribbean and African descent, for example, in the UK. And recently in the um, All of Us research program, I'm not sure, I think Columbia might participate in this, but you know, Black and African Americans, this is over 350,000 um, folks across the United States in clinical centers. Um, so this is a clinical treatment seeking kind of sample. Black and African Americans, lower odds of mood disorder, lower odds of anxiety, lower odds of substitute, you know, sort of lower odds of having common mental disorders. But again, there's this 1.22, there's this higher odds of schizophrenia. So why, so, you know, sort of people have a lot of ideas about, well, why, why are we, what do these findings mean? Are they real? But why, why racism and psychosis? And so there's a camp which I start, definitely started in, which really focused on really the ideas, the way in which psychiatry is a part of medicine and historically has shaped, been shaped by racism, right? Um, we, don't, we don't have to talk about Tuskegee, right? We, there's so many examples of the ways in which racism has shaped um, medicine and conceptualization of particularly black folks in America and other folks of color. And that has shaped diagnostic practices, that has shaped the clinician patient encounter in ways that may overdiagnose schizophrenia, psychosis in Black folks. And then there's another sort of pathway, right? Why racism and psychosis in such a way where racism shapes social determinants, which is something that is receiving more attention. And social determinants are sort of the environments that we age you know, live and play and, and breathe in, right? And how racism has historically shaped the social and physical environments that we, um, we find ourselves in. And there are inequities in how this happens due to racism. So let me just talk about pathway one, which speaks about uh, racism in medicine, and particularly psychiatry. And so the protest psychosis, which has been talked a, a, about a lot more, uh, I've seen it in more presentations now, which I'm excited about because it's really um, phenomenal uh, qualitative uh, analysis of the uh, research done at Ionia State Hospital for the Criminally Insane in Michigan, where they looked at the progress notes, they looked at the charts, and they looked across time from the 1930s to the 1970s talk about a lot of data, right? But this really maps how and when and the process under which schizophrenia kind of became racialized. And it was during the civil rights movement when this happened. And they noted the differences in the descriptions of um, black and white patients with schizophrenia during this time. And so for example, you know, you sort of, you know, 1930s, pre-1960s, I would say, you get things like withdrawn, you know, sort of docile, confused, something that maybe harbors, let's help take care of this person, right? Um, and then sort of during the 1960s, moving into this civil rights movement, you see more descriptions like paranoid, aggressive, dangerous, right? And so it's clear that there was a shift and that was more you know, aggressive, dangerous, paranoid associated with um, um, black folks who are coming in. Um, and so how does this happen, right? Well, 
some folks think that that because of the sociopolitical movements, because of you know institutional racism, that actually black folks aren't necessarily this is artifactual, right? There's a lot of bias, and one of them is we're not even seeing the affective symptoms in black folks if they have some psychosis, right? So there's misdiagnosis in bipolar patients, which studies have shown that. Um, you know, Strakowski out of University of Cincinnati did a lot of work showing how um, affective symptoms get missed. Um, and, you know, Gara at Rutgers showed this where there was this underemphasis of depression in um, black um, outpatients um, compared to white folks patients. And so is there something about the affective component that is clinicians are kind of like not picking up on and sort of knee jerking to schizophrenia. Other folks talk about missing the role of historical racial trauma in the clinical presentation of black folks who come in with um, distress. And so um, Ruth Shem um, uh, recently edited a book where I was a author on a chapter where we looked, talked about social injustice and schizophrenia and talked about case examples where folks were coming in and it was clear that there was a sort of a historical racial trauma involved. And this could look like being more weary, being more guarded um, to, um, around institutions, you know, around, you know, things that feel like you might lose control, lose your freedom, which is like not necessarily not in line with reality, right? And so, um, you know, so there's this other kind of camp sort of thinking about this uh, overdiagnosis, if you will, being being misdiagnosis. Even I did, a, when I was a postdoc, or um, actually after I was a postdoc at Columbia, I did a, a small study with uh, Dolores Malaspina, just comparing like clinician and research diagnoses on a schizophrenia research unit, just to see whether or not there was more discordance between the sort of business as usual clinician diagnosis and the more rigorous, you know, gold standard research based kind of diagnosis. And we found that actually the agreement between the two was lowest among the black uh, patients and highest among the Hispanic patients. Um, and so in talking about that, we sort of felt like, okay, there was less accuracy potentially, that might be one way that this over, you know, diagnosis comes through. Um, and we also found some patterns which weren't necessarily, um, we couldn't really statistically analyze, but like there was a higher portion of the paranoid subtype as opposed to schizoaffective. Again, mapping on to some of the previous work that I just, you know, uh, mentioned. But, um, you know, one of the things we talked about is why was the concordance so high among the Hispanic patients and anecdotally, folks talked about how a lot of times when um, you know, Hispanic folks came in, they had auntie, grandma, cousin, there was a lot of collateral family to sort of say, yeah, no, I saw that, that started, sure, she, she was depressed first or, or what have you. And so how someone enters the care system is a big factor and the cultural expertise and the treatment team, right? That those things may contribute to diagnostic accuracy as well. Okay. So I'm going to move to objective two, where we're talking about racial discrimination and psychotic experiences and how racism is a fundamental cause through social determinants. Path two. So uh, structural racism, um, you know, has an enduring association with health outcomes and inequities in outcomes because it's maintained through multiple pathways by limiting access to flexible resources and often segregated neighborhoods and individual freedoms. When I say individual freedom, you know, sometimes I say, what do you mean by that? It's, it's sort of like the ability to like, you know, what, how Tani C. Coates speaks about it, like to have, you know, be safe in your own body, to not have your body harassed, you know, um, to be able to, you know, seek out opportunities that are available and have opportunities available to you and there's a way in which structural racism is a fundamental cause of health inequities because it limits this um, through multiple pathways. And so um, in a paper that I sort of, I guess it's not that recent, but uh, came out in the Annual Clinical Review of Psychology, I talk about this sort of interconnected inequitable uh, practices, right? 
So when we say structural, it's kind of like, what does that mean, right? It's not being called the N word necessarily, right? But it's really like these institutional systems that are interconnected have inequities that are interconnected. So housing, right? You can think about wh where you're born, you know, if you're born on, you know, 135th and Frederick versus, I don't know, East 90th and York, right? And whether you can live in those areas, depending on your racial background, right? So you have discrimination, inequities in housing, right? Connected to, again, segregation neighborhoods, that's going to affect where you go to school. That's going to affect where your kids go to school. That's going to affect op op educational opportunities, right? And then when that's inequitable, what does that affect, right? What kind of employment opportunities you may have, right? How you, what you might need to do to survive, right? It just, just to, just to eat, if you don't have as many opportunities because it's connected to education and where you live, et cetera. And then there's higher police surveillance in Black and Brown neighborhoods, and so the idea that you might get caught up in the legal system is it is higher probability if there's higher surveillance. So there's a way in which structural racism interconnects these, um, these uh, you know, major institutions that are pretty much unavoidable. You need to have a place to live. You need to be educated, right? Work. And so this system is what is shaping the kinds of social and environmental experiences and, 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 and neighborhood level factors and individual level factors. And these are connected to biological risk, right? And so this is one of the um, theories Compton and Shim talk about where social determinants of mental health, right? This is one of the ways in which uh, social determinants can be connected to mental health. And so we really wanted to look at this in, in like detail in the United States and published a paper from womb to neighborhood and really looking at a racial analysis of social determinants of psychosis in the United States, and including a wonderful group of folks who are clinical high-risk folks, early psychosis folks, but um, folks who are really wanted to amplify the sort of voice, if you will, of really looking at social and context in the study of psychosis. And so this was a like hypothesized model that we um, sort of came up with through our extensive reading of the literature, and this is really US-based. And so seeing structural racism as a fundamental cause of multiple level exposures. So there's, all, there's like a sort of neighborhood collective level as well as an individual level, right? So I may experience a slight, you know, I'm here to give a grand rounds talk, but I'm being mistaken for, you know, oh, you must be the person here to clean, right? That kind of individual level, but also, collective, what's happening in my, my community and how that then can really increase stress and amplify these potential mediating, mediating um, biological mechanisms to then um, increase potential risk for the extended psychosis phenotype. So this is the model that um, you know we've been really, really working from and study, we've been doing empirical studies to kind of test different aspects. And so just from that uh, narrative analysis, um, some of the things that were clear was that racism has historically stru structured US neighborhoods in ways that generationally perpetuates this disadvantage for racially minoritized communities. And so that part was really striking that it's, it's, it's like multiple generations get impacted. And so you can kind of see how that could have, have biological implications as well for psychosis. But the inequities come through healthcare access, healthy food, um, education, same kinds of institutions that I showed you that sort of really structured in neighborhoods quite profoundly in the United States. Um, and ethnic density, which I'll talk about in a little bit, residential instability were highlighted as associated with psychosis outcomes. And it really spoke to the need for more research that really look at like objective measures of the neighborhood, um, which is something I'm working on now with folks at Columbia, um, really looking at the zip code level, um, address level, and really trying to map that 
um, connected to mental health outcomes, particularly psychosis. Another set of findings was this really, you know, sort of everyone who studies schizophrenia knows about, you know, obstetric complications being associated with increased risk in um, offspring. So maternal stress, increase in maternal inflammation, et cetera. Um, but Black women in the U.S. are at substantially increased risk for many of these complications compared to white women. But few studies have actually really like done the cohort prospective um, analysis to see whether this actually might really increase risk in the offspring, disproportionate risk in the offspring of Black women for psychosis. Um, and so sometimes, you know, people say, oh, it's economic, it's economic. But one of the things that we saw was discrimination-related stress was associated with some of these obstetric, obstetric complications over and above whether they, you know, sort of had, took prenatal vitamins or had certain preventative care. It was this discrimination-related stress. And then furthermore, the obstetric complications among Latina women, you know, when we looked and we saw, us, you know, really, really looked into these studies methods, you could see that when women of Latina descent, the longer they resided in the U.S., the more the risk increased versus folks who were first generation or just, you know, sort of just came here even despite poverty or despite um, low socioeconomic um, um, resources. And so there's something about that discrimination that accumulates that could possibly be related. And so I just think this is a really area of research that needs more work in the US in terms of um, linking racism with some of this prenatal work. And then lastly, collective trauma, that was another sort of, uh, factor in that was sort of in the model that I showed you. We all know trauma is, is very much related to everything, but also to psychosis. But one of the things that we don't think about as much is police victimization and gun violence. And we've seen so much of it um, lately, uh, mass shootings, et cetera, but also just like day-to-day -day gun violence in a, in a neighborhood, concentrated in neighborhoods can be examples of collective traumas disproportionately impacting racially minoritized communities in the US. And you know, greater exposure to police victimization and gun fatalities was associated with psychotic experiences. Jordan, one of my good colleagues and now at NYU, um, you know, we looked at this in his data and it was related to psychotic experiences. And so those um, you know, really it just kind of highlighted how, you know, Black and Latinx folks suffer disproportionately from psychosis risk factors at the neighborhood and individual level, in large part because of generations of structural racism. And so that was sort of the conclusion um, from that uh, narrative analysis. So the same path, those two, you know, sort of pathways, right? Why racism and psychosis? Well, the same system may explain why people are more likely to be over or misdiagnosed with schizophrenia, may also explain why people live in social environments that may make them more at risk um, for psychosis and schizophrenia. So typically by now I'd be like, is everybody with me or is everybody, hopefully nobody's sleeping. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna focus a bit specifically on, thank you, <laughs> neighborhood level that level of uh, the analysis, as well as individual level and collective trauma. So generally this model could really look at why you might have increased risk and why you may have decreased prognosis once ill, as, as well as why you might then see increased prevalence in patient population settings. And so it's not really either or, um, I think it could explain a lot of what of some of what some of the empirical findings have been showing. And so I'm going to talk about these sort of subclinical psychotic experiences, which are part of the you know sort of psych psychosis continuum, you know where symptoms are more in line with distress and help seeking disorders, DSM, you know, and then you have uh, sort of clinical high risk. So the psychotic experience and symptoms, you know are often, well, experiences are often, you know, more prevalent in the, in the general population. Um, they're mostly transitory in most folks, but they are more common 
in people suffering from anxiety or depressive disorders, common disorders, but they're associated with more morbidity, more severity. You know, um, I know Roberto did a, Luis Fernandez, at, who's at Columbia, I don't know if he's here, did a study looking among Latinas where it was really associated, among people who didn't have a clinical psychotic disorder, they had these psychotic experiences and symptoms, they were more likely to have suicidal ideation, trauma, right? And so the idea that these are experiences and symptoms that don't require necessarily a clinician who might have biases, let, let's look at these. So a lot of research has looked at this um, part of the continuum to better understand the epidemiology of psychosis and prognosis, et cetera. And so when we look at that epidemiology and we look at Cohen and Marino, their work um, looking at the uh, comprehensive psychiatric epidemiology surveys, where again, you still see this disparity where black um, in particular have the highest prevalence of the psychotic experiences in the general population. Um, then comes um, folks who are Hispanic and then lower among Asian and white um, uh, populations. And so this again, there might be some issues around measurement, right, of, of psychotic experiences, which could be a whole nother talk. But again, we see this disparity persisting even without a clinician present. Um, and so one of the studies that I you know, really wanted to look, understand is when I think of the individual level of day-to-day um, -day discrimination um, and major discriminatory events, like both happen, right, and they're both a part of the system of racism. And so I looked at racial microaggressions and major discriminatory events to see whether they explained ethno-racial differences in psychotic experiences. And what I found was that, um, that they actually both contributed their own unique um, contribution to explaining psychotic experiences and the differences between white and black um, young people and um, Latino, Latino versus black folks. So Black folks had the highest um, endorsement of psychotic experiences compared to Latinos and whites. Um, and so part of this was explained by major discriminatory events and those racial microaggressions, which I'm sure most people know by now are those subtle, but sometimes just really toxic because it's just like repeated like indignities and slights, assumptions made, invalidations because of how you're perceived, right? Um, racially. And so again, racial discriminatory experiences may be a big factor here in psychosis or psychotic experiences. In the Healthy Mind study, one of my other um, friends and colleagues, Hanzo, um, looked at this um, in terms of psychotic experiences, this you know, subclinical end again, using the WHO CD psychosis screen. Again, there was a disparity between black and white um, uh, college students. Um, and so interestingly, which you know, I see it at City College actually, food insecurity was a, a, was a pretty big mediator as well as discrimination again. Um, and so the idea that you're a college student and you're still food insecurity is something, a social determinant you could think of that maybe you'd be more protected from, but that actually explained a good portion of the um, difference between black and white college students in their endorsement of psychotic experiences. And here's just a sort of another example of, a, this is a nationally representative small survey um, where we looked at specific um, psychotic experiences as well as any reported. And again, the similar pattern of um, black and Latinx young adults, and these were emerging adults showing higher prevalence. Okay. And so in that study, one of the things that um, we did was really try to see well, what, what kinds of mediators um, were most relevant in that, you know, in those uh, ethno-racial differences. And so police violence exposure, again, came up racial, and, and, and these weren't even in the narrative uh, review that uh, we did back in 20, you know, 21. Racial discrimination, adverse childhood experiences, and educational attainment. Again, social determinants that um, might be more relevant here. They mediated the racial and ethnic differences in psychotic experiences just noted. So 
you know, I've sort of given all this bad news, right? <laughs> so well, there's a something that I've been very much interested in, which has mostly been looked at in Northern European countries, but the idea that neighborhood ethnic density could really be actually protective. Um, and so what is neighborhood ethnic density? It's basically the proportion of your own ethnic group or just generally minoritized groups in your neighborhood. It's been looked at both ways. And the meta analysis um, done by Becares and, and, and folks really highlighted that this uh, protective factor is relevant for various mental health outcomes, but particularly for psychosis, not to the same degree as say depression or anxiety. And so, you know, studies have shown this in different ways where for folks who are, you know, ethno and um, ethno racial minoritized individuals living in high ethnically dense neighborhoods and, you know, high meaning sometimes it's more than 25%, like it varies depending on study, but the idea is that there's some protection there um, from the effects of racial discrimination by way of maybe higher social support, community networks, and social cohesion. And so when you're in a low neighborhood, ethnic dense, ethnically dense neighborhood, there's this increased odds of psychosis. And this has been shown in the Netherlands in case control studies and it's been shown in the, um, in the UK in case control studies for psychotic disorders, so not just psychotic experiences. Um, and so I wanted to look at this um, in one of the biggest uh, networks of folks who are at clinical high risk for psychosis, the North American Prodromal Longitudinal Study, which you know sort of has several uh, PIs um, based on university, but at different um, parts of the United States, um, and really looking at area level minoritized ethnic density and whether or not here in the US we would see something similar. <clears throat> One second here. Okay. And so in this study, for those of you who are familiar with the Naples, too, you know, folks came in, they were given the structured interview for prodromal syndromes um, to determine whether they were considered at clinical high risk. Um, they completed sociodemographic variables. And they also answered a question, you know, what town or city did you spend most of your childhood? And one of um, my collaborators, Benson Koo, who's at Emory, he coded the towns and the cities to a Phipps County code so that we could sort of look at the area level um, SES variables. Um, um, and I was, I particularly was interested in ethnic density. And then folks were also asked a self-report measure about perceived discrimination, which is also something I was interested in. And so this baseline cohort was followed up over 24 months um, to determine illness progression. Some folks went into remission, 28%. Um, Some folks stayed symptomatic, 30%. Some progressed, got worse, 25%, and then some converted, 18%. And so the goal was to understand whether or not how you, where you grew up as a child in terms of the level of you know, diversity, if you will, in your neighborhood, how does that potentially impact um, how you are two, two years later? And so what I found um, with, about 590 follow-up observations was that a higher degree of area level minoritized childhood ethnic density was related to a lower likelihood of staying symptomatic compared to going in remission, um, lower likelihood of progressing compared to being in remission at two-year follow-up. And there was no significant relationship with, uh, with uh, conversion versus remission. But this to me was pretty, this is published in um, JAMA Sykes, um, in case you wanna check out some of the details, but it was really consistent with uh, some of the work that had been done in Northern European countries um, and some of the work that I did looking at psychotic experiences. But what I think is particularly important here is that it, this is during childhood. And when I think of childhood, it's like, okay, what is happening, right? Where you live, where you go play, who's around you, your school, like those things might have an even bigger impact 
than we really um, think, think about. And so how can we potentially intervene earlier? And so one of the things that we also looked at was well, what might explain some of this, uh, you know, you know, better, you know, more likely to go into remission growing up in a very diverse uh, neighborhood as a child and discrimination, less discrimination over the lifetime mediated 11.4%, right? So there's still more to explain, right? This, this um, interesting relationship um, and it's a prospective longitudinal relationship, but um, discrimination again is a relevant factor. Okay, so neighborhoods with a plurality of ethnicities may mean no one ethnic group feels isolated and that may have implications for stress, for other kinds of, um, you know, sort of neurobiological um, reactions. Um, in, in neighborhoods with high ethno-racial diversity may have the capacity to attenuate the stress and isolation associated with discrimination. You know, I, I remember talking with some colleagues um, who are, you know, uh, also uh, of color, where sometimes you're in a room and there's something said, and it's sort of like that's that didn't that didn't really feel good. It didn't come out right, you know. And there's no one in the room to kind of look and go, "Did you just hear that?" Right? <laughs> um, when you're isolated, you just kind of hold all that without having that validity check person, right? And so, might that be also a you know relevant factor for those for those day to day types of particularly microaggressions, which I talked about earlier. And just really, it highlights, and I can unfortunately see it in my own children, that you know that attunement to like attributions of racial difference really does begin early. You know, the idea that lighter skin is prettier or that straighter hair is, that's right. Those kinds of things get picked up at a very early age in these, in these ways that will matter if one is young, growing up in a school, maybe like more likely to be bullied if you're the end of one Asian kid in the school or, you know, black kid in the school, et cetera. So um, I just think it actually speaks to like another benefit of diversity. Okay, so I'm looking at the time. I'm gonna move fast. Okay, so objective three. So in terms of thinking of like, how do we, you know, improve things? How do we understand where to intervene? This is a study that I I, I did as a part of OPAL, um, really trying to understand what in the neighborhood, especially connected to racism, especially this was during the pandemic, during a lot of the um, awakenings, if you will, of wow, racism is really impacting people with the George Floyd incident. But I wanted to do a study that really focused on Black young people with the first episode of psychosis using mixed methods, right? Obviously, I was trained in psychiatric epidemiology, but I've been definitely seeing the real power of creative uh, qualitative methods. And so I used a method called photo voice, which really has folks out there taking pictures of whatever it is you're prompting them to and discussing it in a group, coming back and discussing it in a group. So this is the Black Photo Speak Research Project. And so this recruitment was done through On Track New York, um, through wonderful team leaders, peer specialists, shout, shout out to um, Chaku and the, the youth, um, 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 the youth's uh, group. And so the idea was to really get an understanding from their visual and verbal and lived perspective of what, what it's like. And so they had to, so, you know, they had to uh, respond to three prompts. We met uh, three different times. This was all virtual again during the pandemic where they had to think about how racism, you know, affect their men mental well being, And we really didn't, you know, we stayed away from like words like psychosis, schizophrenia, you know, which is sort of like, you know, how's racism affecting in your community? In your, your well being, how did it affect you? You know, entering your current treatment program prior to, and then what factors within your family are supporting your path towards mental well being and, and, and your community? And so folks had to take pictures and write a, 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 a caption in response to this in different sessions. And so um, there are 
about 13 um, young black folks, good amount of males, um, which I'm was really excited about, um, relatively low income, um, and um, yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna kind of cut to the chase here with some, some of the results. There's some quantitative results, but it's such a small sample that it's not really as relevant. What's really, really, I thought was most uh, important was looking at what themes came from the narratives and the photos. And so what did anti-Black racism look like for these folks, right? Tokenism and lack of belonging was a big one. Hypervisibility. And so you can imagine if you're already, you know, struggling with some symptomatology, like that's that feeling of being hypervisible and like you're the only one in the room. Concerns about police, not surprising, right? But that was like a big issue. But but what I thought was also interesting was another theme that came up was this chronic exposure and almost minimization of it. So like desensitize, desensitize to it almost in a way, but not, right? So outwardly like, oh, this happens. But then when you look at the photos, you realize, no, this is really affecting people. And then another theme that came out in terms of home, neighborhood and community, it was just mixed feelings about it. There was this like mixture, right? It wasn't just like, oh, I love home. I love my community or oh, my community is bad. There was this mixture, which you could imagine. And so, this is just some of the quotes that folks, you know, um, from different participants speaking about what that lack of belonging looked like. It's important, especially being like African American in a Caucasian world. I felt like the outcast. I felt like I didn't belong. I went to a 70% white college straight out of high school, and it was a very different environment. I had a hard time feeling comfortable sleeping, eating, because I felt like an outcast. So you can imagine how that adjustment coupled with this, you know, sort of potentially managing emerging symptoms could be particularly difficult. Um, and so this was a photo that a participant um, shared and I've shared in previous presentations. And they've given me permission for this, you know, sort of in response. So how's racism showing up in your community and how does it affect your mental health? So I just kind of want to take five seconds, take a look at it. You could have various reactions, right? But in the morning, she, which the person showed this, we all looked at it and we all had a moment just like this, take it in. And then the person shared, you know, what their caption was. And I'm gonna paraphrase it here. Seems like a part of a parking sign, yet it says, stop killing black people. That's a big trigger for me because someone put that up assuming it's gonna give people a lesson but just trying to have a good day and this sign is thrown in my face, pretty heavy. What did the person have in mind who put this up? So you could see how this could this could fuel a bit of like, what, what's the intention here, right? Here is a reminder that my life could be put in danger for no reason. How often do I need to keep being reminded that my life matters? There's more to me, you know? And it, and it led to a discussion about how there could be good triggers and bad triggers in your neighborhood. And, you know, sort of like, how do you deal with neighborhoods that are changing, right? Um, even thinking about things connected to gentrification. And so this, so much richness came from this photo. So I just, again, felt just so honored to be able to, to do this project and see these creative, brilliant um, young people. Here's another one. There's no place like home, click your heels three times. So again, and this was how it would be, we'd look at it and we, I mean, I was always blown away like, wow. And so the caption this person indicated is where I come from, I'm used to having a big police presence. So it's like with this picture, I always think like home, like feeling sometimes like a prison cell, but other times it's just like, it's beautiful at the same time. Like I think I said, a rose that grows in concrete. I mean, that's like really profound. You see this barbed wire with like, like stay out prison, like barbed wire and then these beautiful flowers, right? But you can't access it, right? Mixed. Um, another one, this was talking about, you know, prior to entering treatment, what was happening 
and she had got this was one of the precincts that she you know was arrested um they picked me up outside of the un i don't think it would have had anything to do with my race at least that is what i'd like to believe but who's to say if another journalist that wasn't black was standing in front of the un talking would they have like reacted the same way I feel like they have in the past, but I don't know if they've done it towards too many white women, but that could have been part of it. So you could see like there's this almost like, <clears throat> you know, cognitive load, just trying to think through like, was this racial or was this not? And I think that's a part of um, what happens that I think could be connected to cognitive, um, you know, challenges that folks have to contend with that are sparked by things connected to racism. Okay, so I'm gonna move to community themes that came from this study, which I thought were really important. And it was clear to me that community was an extension of family. And so like when I remember one participant said, you know, my, my community, they sent cards and stuff. They would always ask my mom and other siblings about me. This was when he was hospitalized. I live in a neighborhood where everyone knows each other, you know, in my community, like I was just seeing like elders, I guess reminded me I can get there, like learn for the, from these mistakes and learn when I can just keep like reminding myself when I see someone older than me in a better position. So it speaks to like having good models in the neighborhood and how that can have a positive effect. This was, um, and I won't read all of this, but this was a you know, sort of very powerful um, uh, caption connected to, and I've kind of kind of grayed out their faces, hopefully effectively, but um, speaking about on track and what about it is particularly helpful. And you know, she talks about like like there, there's a whole team, you know, somebody's gonna be there to help me with even applications, right? they're super patient, you know, I just keep going in and I got like more comfortable. I can trust that they're going to help me. So there's an element of like needing to build that trust in these, you know, systems that are meant to be health systems, right? But understanding that there is a skepticism there from, you know, frankly, historical um, realities and trauma. So in conclusion, you know, racism is there shaping lives, perceptions, opportunities, even when it's not explicit, even when it's not explicit. Social community context has impact, both negative and positive. And so can we can we look at both, right? I'm obviously focused a lot on the negative, but like something about having cohesion in communities and feeling like your community is a part of your family, like how can that be, you know, um, you know cultivated? in how we deliver treatment. True diversity in our treatment settings. How do we decrease tokenism and hypervisibility? Because it's particularly an issue, I think, for folks who may be having emerging psychotic experiences and symptoms. Hypervisibility, hypervisibility increases paranoid ideation, which feeds the sense of hypervisibility, hypervisibility. So you can see how they sort of feed into each other. And so, it's, to me, that means it's it's also particularly important to, to sort of decrease that since it can feed. And so addressing some of these factors may increase treatment engagement overall and improve prognosis. Um, and so the solutions, we need to address both pathways. I'm not saying their clinicians don't have work to do around, you know, sort of how they are attuned to difference in the treatment room, you know? And so do we keep doing DEI work in psychiatry, right? Doing better with how our, our measurement that we're capturing the same thing across different, you know, populations. Increasing the use of the cultural formulation in intake, like really actually using it um, and really getting a sense of the person's context, social context, as we think about also their symptoms. And then addressing the other pathway, right? Going upstream for interventions, reducing inequities in the systems, policies, you know, addressing discrimination in our interventions, right? Like directly um, and, and, and sort of help, how, how to help folks um, manage that directly, um, especially if it's sort of 
experienced in a way that's traumatic. And so just some more take home points. Um, psychosis includes a spectrum of experiences and symptoms with increasing degrees of dysfunction that could be a component of many different disorders. And even that I think is important in terms of how we sort of diagnose or how we think about what we um, consider folks are struggling with who may come to us. Um, they're imp significantly impacted and shaped by social context, especially, especially in neighborhoods. Um, and that needs to be studied more, I think, with neighborhood level objective uh, data. Racism shapes the lives of people of color in the clinical encounter. I um, mean, I think many studies have shown that, especially in counseling site, but you know, how does discrimination affect your patients? How does that contribute to their clinical picture? Again, keeping in mind that it may not be obvious to that person in the moment, you know, what information are you not hearing because of your socially dominant identities? And I think sometimes that's kind of the humility, that cultural humility where you have to kind of like think you're also coming to this with your own culture and own identities. It's not just like a one-way uh, street, right? And so subtle mi racial microaggressions can really impede just open communication and effectiveness. And so how to really be culturally humble, like I said, knowing that it's gonna leak <laughs> in the therapeutic dyad. Um, you, and if you're not attuned to it or not open to it, then you won't be, you won't see it. Um, Cultural meaning making systems brought to the interaction by each participant. And silence around these things just may shut down open communication on a topic that might be particularly relevant to your patient's life, you know? Um, and so it's not sort of like, what does it feel like to be working with someone who's white? Like, not, like it's not putting the onus on them to, you know, sort of break down racism in the room, but like, just are you open to hearing it? Sometimes that can be picked up on. And then just probably, you know, just sort of a plug for a really, I think, great uh, comprehensive paper about social determinants of mental health that speaks about some specific kinds of interventions that have been employed at the larger level, you know, in terms of, um, you know, doing things around physical built environment, but also at the individual level. Um, and so there are definitely things that we can start doing, but for those of you who like to study, you know, epidemiology and, you know, sort of connect, connect the dots, there's still a lot of work there too. And so these are just some other resources um, and, and, and papers that I think are pretty uh, important for thinking about this kind of work, Black History Month, right, but like, all year through, things that uh, are, are relevant here. And in particular, this evidence-based approach for treating stress and trauma due to racism, I highly recommend. I think it's like we're moving in a great direction. You know, Monica Williams, University of Ottawa, I, you know, sort of thinking about how to integrate these things that are relevant for folks into existing paradigms that we, that we have, as, as well as changing and sort of creating new paradigms. So I just wanna thank and acknowledge lots of wonderful folks at On Track and OPAL and funding from um, New York State Office of Mental Health, amazing collaborators and my amazing team at CCNY. I used to have all their pictures, um, but they were like, I don't know, we need to redo them. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> so thank you so much for your uh, time and attention.